Good morning, and welcome to Memorial Baptist Church. Uh, you're going to see some differences and hear some differences today, and that's because we had our sound system installed, and we know what we're doing. <laughs> we really do. We know what we're doing. We got microphones, we got people, we got you. What could go wrong? This is going to be great. I've got some announcements to start us off. Uh, the first, there's no youth tonight. Uh, I will uh, share with you, we had 12 ladies come for our girls lock-in on Friday. A good time was had by all, and a lot of sleep was made up for yesterday. <laughs> Today is our last lemonade on the lawn uh, for the year. We'll resume in May, so don't leave without a cookie. And y'all better drain all that lemonade because I don't have kids to give it to tonight. So keep coming back for more and keep talking with each other. Wednesday night's Bible study continues as we go through the early church. Uh, and Todd's leading that for a few months. And uh, it's been uh, very successful with a good turnout so far. This coming Wednesday night, September the 6th, our first choir practice of the fall will kick off. That is at 730. Um, the week Following that, on the 13th, Wednesday night programming, suppers and shenanigans kick back off. If you would, hit the sign-up sheet in the back uh, so that we can take record of who's coming. We have a new caterer. We want to make sure we get the number close because we don't have Patsy's brilliance to make sure she makes just enough for everybody that's coming that doesn't tell us. Uh, our community Bible study on September the 7th kicks off with uh, Clay Sterrett. That's Thursday morning from 1030 to 1130. There is a lot going on. If you're new to Memorial Baptist Church, there is always a lot going on. But we don't always know that you're here as a visitor. So if you will look in the, the seat back in front of you, there is a, a welcome card that we would like for you to fill out. You can set it in the offering plate in the back on your way out, and then we got you, and we want to get you. So let us know that you're, that you're here, that you're worshiping with us, and uh, let's start our service off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for this day. I'm thankful that we get a few more weeks of warmth of your son on our shoulder before we transition seasons. What a wonderful time to be here, wonderful time to get settled back in and a wonderful time to take in your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. We're starting off with a beautiful, wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, page 96 in your hymnal, also on the wall. Stand and sing.
reading, our reading this morning is going to come from Psalms 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You swept them away like a flood, and they fall asleep. In the morning, they're like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew, and towards the evening, it fades and withers away. We've been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath, we are dismayed. We have been placed our iniquities before you. Our secret sin is in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years. Or if we're strong, even 80. And yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger, your fury, according to the fear that is due you? Lord, teach us to number our days that we may be present to you in a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord, how long will it be? Be sorry for your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us with. In the years that we have seen trouble, let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, Lord, confirm the work of our hands. Blessed be the reading of the word of God. Can you stand as we sing, Graves into Graves?
come together today for our meditation and prayer, aren't we so fortunate to have a place such as this to bring our stuff such as we have it? We're so fortunate. And we have people that will pray for us every day by name if we bring it to them and to their attention. Uh, so as we go to meditation today, I am hopeful that we'll take thanks with us. We'll take our thanks and our adoration for the people of this place and for the spirit that inhabits each and every person that comes with an open mind. Join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, I think about, I think about your love and I think about your timing and that for our good, the things that happen in our lives very often good or bad, happen in your own time in spite of what our own desires may be. Lord, I ask that this morning, in your time, each ear would tune into your message, that each ear would hear how wonderful the sacrifice, wonderful the sacrifice we've been given in your death on the cross for each and every one of our sins that we turn to you. Lord, I ask that you would be with us and be with each speaker this morning. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.
with all my heart and all my mind. Through all the doubt I seem to find, I'm gonna love you with all the questions, all Beautiful message. Thank you so much for that. Beautiful singing, beautiful song, and it's something that each and every one of us needs to take to heart that we need to, in the midst of all of our trials and turmoil, all of the good days and bad days, we need to love him and because he first loved us. Well, this morning we're going to be in... Uh, Psalms 90. Uh, we read it, um, read through it already. We're going to take a look at just a, a couple specific verses in there this morning. But before we get started, let me tell you a story about a man who worked at a factory in a town. And one of his main jobs was to make sure that the whistle blew every day at five o'clock make sure that everybody knew it was time for them to wrap up and go home. And so every day as he walked to work, he passed a jewelry store. And in the uh, front display case of this jewelry store was a, a magnificent grandfather clock. And every morning he would stop and he would look at the clock and he would pull out his pocket watch and he would set his time and make sure that it was lined up and he would be on his way. And every day at five o'clock, the whistle would blow. Well, one morning as he was walking to work, the jewelry store owner happened to be out front. He was sweeping, cleaning up a little bit. And the man asked him, he said, you know, this is a magnificent clock. I love this clock. How do you keep time so well with this clock? And he said, well, every day at five o'clock when the factory whistle blows, I come and... <laughs> You know, we live by the clock. Many of us do. Because time is important to each and every one of us. Benjamin Franklin said, don't squander the time that you have because it's the stuff that life is made of. And you know, we fight the clock. Habitually, as a, as a way of life, we fight for more time. We stay up as late as we can. We try and squeeze in whatever shows we can. We try and do whatever. We sleep as late as we possibly can and turn off the alarm and turn off the alarm and turn off the alarm. I know some people that have four different alarms, five different alarms set because the first one isn't enough. And I'm going to tell a story on my wife because she's not here to defend herself. <laughs> she sets an alarm on her phone. I set an alarm on my phone. The alarm on my phone goes off, I get out of bed. 
the alarm on her phone goes off, she snoozes it. And then the second one goes off and she snoozes that one. And then the third one goes off and she snoozes that one. And I, I had to ask her, I'm like, honey, why, I mean, you set an alarm, why don't you just set it for the time you want to get up? She goes, well, I'm not ready to get out of bed yet. I said, well, don't, don't set the alarm for 10 minutes sooner then. Set it for when you want to get out of bed. She goes, well, then I'll lay here another 10 minutes. <laughs> She's trained herself that she needs to have that time of opening her eyes and laying there for a little bit before she greets the rest of the day. And so you have a couple different kinds of people out there. I am the kind where the alarm goes off, I'm up, I'm going. And for her, not so much. But you know, people, we, uh, our lives run by the clock. You can rush frantically, getting kids to school, trying to get to work on time. Fast food has made things so much easier for us to pop in for a quick bite and eat it in the car as we're driving down the road and shaving or putting on makeup or whatever at a stoplight. And so we're trying to squeeze so much into so little time. And as you study scripture, as you read through scripture and you look at the New Testament and you get all of these life lessons that we're all supposed to learn, one of the things that always amazes me, Jesus is never in a hurry. He's never in a hurry. He's never pressed to go anywhere. He sleeps in the midst of the storm. He takes time away. He says, I need to go and pray. I need time away. I need time for myself. He's never in a hurry. And even though he knew he only had a few years to minister, he never ran, never got stressed about things, but he made time to consider the flowers and the birds he had time to put his hands on the little children and to bring them up into his lap and to bless them and to care for them. He made time to travel aside from his path and go and have dinner with sinners. He made time to sit and talk to people who were struggling through their hurt, through their hang-ups, through, through, through all of the things that were going on in their lives. He made time. And the Bible gives us some very good insight on how time can become our friend instead of our enemy. You know, God exists outside of time. He's not bound by it. He's not bound up by space, by time. He doesn't wear a, a Timex on his wrist. He doesn't have a, a day timer or anything like that. He is the creator of time. He is greater than time. And so if we want to really recognize how much time we have and how big of a gift it is, we have to look at what his scripture tells us. We have to immerse our life in God and, and learn from him. And in Psalm 90, we read this morning that time is important. Psalm 90 verse 12, it says, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Teach us, Lord. Show us. Show us what it is you would have us to do, the, the things that need to be important in our lives so that we can put all of the other things aside. You know, there's an interesting allegory that's out there. It talks about how every morning your bank account is filled up. Every morning you are credited $86,400. And it is yours to spend throughout the day. And do with it as you wish. But every evening, your bank account, whatever is remaining, is deleted. And so every morning, you are credited with 86,400 seconds. 
and it's yours to choose to do with however you see fit. But recognize that at the end of the day, when it rolls over to 12.01 a.m., whatever remainder you had is gone. There's no overdraft. There's no savings. There's no going back. The clock continues to run. And so this morning, I want to pour, point out four things to you. It's an acronym. I don't usually do this, but this morning it's an acronym, and it's TIME. T-I-M-E, and we'll talk about the four different things. You have treasure, invest, manage, and enjoy. Treasure your time, invest your time, manage your time well, and enjoy the time that you have. God says that we should treasure our time. It's a valuable commodity. He also tells us that we learn, we need to learn how to number our days. Now there is a, it's attributed to a writer named Mark Levy, but you never know. It, it, it's out there on the internet, and so anybody could take, uh, take credit for this. But there's a quote that goes like this. If you want to realize the value of a year, talk to a student who failed a course. If you want to realize the value of a month, talk to a mother who gave birth to a premature child. You want to realize the value of a day, talk to someone who was born on February 29th. How valuable is an hour? Talk to those two lovebirds who are just waiting to meet. How valuable is a minute? Ask the person who missed the train or miss the subway on their way to work that morning? How valuable was a second? Talk to the person who just narrowly missed a head-on collision with another car. How valuable was a millisecond? Well, talk to that Olympic swimmer who didn't qualify, just barely. Time is valuable across the board. And we need to treasure every moment that we have. Every single moment that we have. Have you heard the expression that time is money? It's not. It's not true. Time is much more valuable than money. You can always make more money. It may be hard to do. It may take a lot of effort. It may take some ingenuity. You can make more money. But folks, you will never make more time. It is impossible. It's non-renewable. It's non-transferable. You can't store it up. You can't slow it up. Anybody remember the singer uh, Jim Croce? I, I was I was a strange child. I loved all kinds of indie. I, Jim Croce was. I loved him when I was a kid. There was a song, "If I Could Save Time in a Bottle." First thing that I'd like to do is save every day till eternity passes away so I could spend them with you. Folks, you can't. You can't save time, but you can invest it. You can invest time in things. You can invest time in your future. You can invest time in your family. You can invest time in your church, in your community, or in your relationship with Christ. You can invest the time that you have been given, but you can't save it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Jim Croce, just a couple months after he wrote that song, tragically died in a plane crash. He didn't even realize that as he was writing that song, as he was recording it and singing it for everybody, his life was going to be demanded of him. And he didn't have any more time to save up to spend with his loved ones on this world. You know, we, um, we like to think that we are saving time somehow. We've created all kinds of things to make it easier for us. Microwaves. Microwave dinners. You gotta love them. You gotta love them. You throw it in the microwave. You know, what used to take 45 minutes in the oven now it takes 45 seconds in the microwave. It's great. 
You can put things in the fridge, reheat it, pull it out, it's ready very, very quickly. You don't have to spend as much time in the kitchen, as much time cooking and preparing, as much time getting everything ready for yourself or for your family. So the question is, what have you now done? What have we done with all of that extra time? Instead of 45 minutes in the kitchen, what have we done with the additional 44 minutes that we now have? One minute in the microwave and it's done. What, what, what have we done with the rest of the time? Have we invested it in anything? What have you used it for? Have you mowed the yard? Maybe you did laundry. Maybe you were spending time with your kids. Maybe you were doing something somewhere or maybe Facebook got a hold of you and you were scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Maybe you got tied up in the stories that you saw there. Maybe you just started surfing the internet. Maybe you were reading the latest news report that you really don't want to read. What did you do with the time that you had? Where did you invest it? You know, where we invest our time says something about us. There's 168 golden hours each week. The average person sleeps for about 50 of those. 50 to 56 hours a week you sleep. That's a third of your time. About 24 hours of those are eating or personal hygiene. And about 50 of those hours are working or traveling to and from work. Folks, that's 130 hours. So that leaves you with about 35 hours a week that's not sleeping, eating, showering, or working. 35 hours a week, five hours per day that you have free to do something. You know, if we were to follow you around and observe what you did for those five hours a day, we'd be able to tell you what you value in your life, what you consider to be the most important thing in your life, and you may not like the answer. You may not agree with it. You may feel guilty afterwards. But if you really focused on those five hours of free time a day, you would see what you truly value. Might be surfing the internet, might be watching television, reading a magazine. The question is, how much of that discretionary time are you using for your Lord and Savior? How much are you using for your family? How much are you using reading the Word? How much are you using in prayer? How much are you using in your community? It was a study of 2,500 households, 2,500 households done by the University of Michigan. And it found that mothers who work outside the home, on average, spend 11 minutes a day, 30 minutes on the weekends with their kids. So out of those five hours that you have free, 11 minutes of that goes towards one-on-one -on -one interaction with children. It's even worse for fathers. Fathers spend an average of eight minutes a day with their children. Eight minutes a day on average with your kids. You ever heard somebody say, well, I may not spend a whole lot of time with them, but at least it's quality time. At least I have quality time with my family. At least I have quality time in the scripture. At least I have quality time in prayer. Well, let me ask you this question. If I have a $100 bill in my hand and I roll it up and I stomp on it and I get it dirty and then I try and give it to you, but then I have a cream, crisp, $5 bill in the other hand. 
And I say, which one do you want? Which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick that $100 bill, right? Because it's worth more. It's more valuable. But this one's quality. This one's, this one's brand new. This one's nice and crisp and shiny. Folks, quality time really is a misnomer. Any time that you devote to anything is going to be quality time. And we need to learn how to manage that. We need to learn how to manage the, the time that we have been given. You know, all the money that we receive, all of the time that we have, you may not want to, to recognize it, but all of it is a gift from God. And he has been given it to us so that we would be good stewards, not only of the money that we've been given, but also the time that we have been given. You know, there's an entire field of study out there called time management. And in almost every business in America, consultants are hired. People are brought in to teach executives and workers how to, how to better manage their time, how to go through and, and organize and streamline their calendars and things like that. Time management is a, is a hot topic. There's even a book out there, The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's written by Stephen Covey. And he says this, time management really is a misleading concept. You cannot manage time. You can't delay it. You can't speed it up. You can't save it. You can't lose it. No matter what you do, time keeps moving forward at the same rate. The challenge is not to manage time. The challenge is to manage ourselves. And that's exactly what scripture says. Psalms 90 says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. We need to learn how to manage ourselves. We need to learn how to manage ourselves in the midst of this thing that is time. The Bible uses another word. Instead of managing your time, Scripture talks about redeeming the time that we have been given. Paul writes, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. It means that we need to constantly be looking around, to be taking advantage, to make the most out of every opportunity. It's football season again. High school ball, midgets. We were out on the... We were out on the football field on Saturday. Zeke was out there playing it, and it's amazing to sit there and be able to watch all of the different ages go out there and play. One of the greatest running backs of all time was a man named Emmett Smith. And I saw a move on the football field Saturday that reminded me of Emmett Smith. Emmett Smith wasn't the biggest, he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the strongest. But what Emmett did better than anybody else was he ran with his eyes wide open and his head on a swivel. And he wouldn't power through everybody, but he would see an opening. He would see a gap, he would see a hole, and he would cut back and make a line for that hole. And that's the way that each one of us needs to be able to live with our head on a swivel for us to, to take a look at all of the opportunities that are out there so that we would invest our time wisely. Because when an opportunity has passed us by, it can't be reclaimed. That opportunity is gone forever. The other thing we need to realize is that while every moment is a gift from God, we need to recognize that if we don't manage ourselves, if we don't manage the time that we have been given, somebody else will do it for you. Mm. If you don't manage yourself in the time that you have been given, someone else will do it for you. You need to think about where you're going to spend it, where you're going to invest it. Because if you aren't controlling your schedule, somebody else is going to be happy to control it for you. People complain they don't have enough time to spend with their family. 
I don't have enough time to do this. We don't have enough time to do that. I have spent the last week reorganizing my schedule. And I came in this morning and I sat down with Mark. I said, Mark, would you join right here? I said, will you pray with me? Because I'm a little haggard right now. Not because I don't love my kids, not because I don't love my family, but because my whole schedule has been turned on its head. And the things that I used to depend upon Angel to do are falling on me right now. And that's okay. I'm not looking for sympathy. But I have had to rearrange and reorganize everything that I normally do. I needed to be able to manage myself better so that I could manage the time that I have with my family, with the church, with hospital visits, with being here to help set things up, with being out there, just everything that comes along with it. And if I didn't do that, <laughs> I would have been a blubbering mess this morning. But you know what? The kids got fed. They have clothes on. They have showers. There's no knots in their hair, which is great. I mean, come on. Think about it. Zeke, where is Zeke? Where? I don't even know where my kids are. I went to look for him over here, and I see Mike Lacey. You're not Ezekiel. That's okay. Goodness gracious. Thank you, Bowman clan, for rounding them up. Mm. I didn't even know where they were. Oh, heaven help me. But you know what? <laughs> they were here, and this is a safe place, and this is family. And so when they're here, I trust. I trust that if I'm not taking care of them, at least someone in the community will. And set them aside and pull them aside and say, hey, come here, you come sit with us today. But you know what? If you don't manage your time, somebody else is going to manage it for you. And the last thing I want to say is this. Enjoy your time. Enjoy the time that you've been given. Say no to those things that rob your time of you. There's always going to be something else you can do. There's always going to be somewhere else you can be. But if you're going to make spending time a priority, figure out where you're going to invest it. Say yes to those things that are going to be important in your life, in the life of your family, in the future, in the life of your relationship with your Lord and Savior. I'm going to leave you with this. When you say yes to something, realize that you have already said no to everything else. So make sure what you're saying yes to is the right thing. Join me as we pray and we transition to our time of communion. Heavenly Father, there are a lot of people out there that are running around with their hair on fire. And Lord, I pray that as we look forward to this time of the Lord's Supper, of communion, of being a family and remembering what it is you've done for us. Lord, I pray that we would take the time that has been offered to us to rest in your goodness, in your mercy, and that we would find peace in you. And that, Lord, as we search our hearts and search our actions, search our minds and our thoughts. Lord, that you would bring to the forefront and reveal to us those things that are just not of you. Lord, you would allow us to recall those opportunities, those times where we have sinned against our brother, our sister, where we have sinned against you, where we have fallen short. Lord, I pray that over these next few minutes that we would ask for your forgiveness. That we would seek your face and that we would just desire 
overwhelmingly to be made more and more like you daily. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. If we could have our deacons prepare the table. Deacons approach the table. This morning as we enter into this time of communion, I want to let you know a few things. We're going to be passing the plate for you this morning. And what I'd like for you to do is hang on to that element, that body, that blood, the representation of Christ. Hold on to it until we can all partake together. The other thing that I'd like for you to know is that um, if you have any sort of allergy, this is all allergen free. You are free to partake. If you are a believer in Christ, if you're a baptized believer in Christ, we invite you to join with us as we participate in open communion this morning. You need not be a member of Memorial Baptist Church but you do need to be a member of the body of Christ in order to take freely of what it is he has offered to us. Heavenly Father, again, we find ourselves at the table. We find ourselves standing before the representations of your body and your blood. And Lord, I pray that as we pass this out to the family, to the congregation, to those who are gathered here, Lord, that we would each in our own way uh, seek your face and your truth. Lord, Scripture tells us that we should not partake unworthily. And so, Lord, I pray that over the next few minutes that each one of us would repent of those sins that are in our life, that we would be able to come to this table with a clean heart, clean conscience, knowing that we are living our lives for you and you alone. Lord, it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.
First Corinthians says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood that you poured out for us willingly separates us from what a mere person would do to the divine. Being willing to shed blood for an undeserving mass is truly holy. Lord, I ask that as we partake of this cup, we would do the remembrance justice in recognition that your blood spilt for each of us, undeservedly. In Jesus' name, amen.
In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Scripture tells us that for as often as we eat this bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist, whatever name that you would like to call it, is a proclamation of Christ living for us, dying on the cross for our sins, his burial and his resurrection. It is a promise of eternal life. And so when we participate, we're doing so. Not only reminding ourselves of what Christ did for us, but it's also an opportunity for us to then remind everyone else. Because when you leave this place this morning, when you go out of here, hopefully you have thought about time about how to manage yourselves in the midst of time. But more than that, as we approach the table this morning, you thought about those things that are in your life that need to get chipped away, need to get remolded, that need to look more like Christ. And so as you leave this place, you're going to shine that much brighter. You're going to walk that much taller. Your speech is going to be that much cleaner. And your actions to the people around you are just going to be that much more glorious because Christ is the one who lives in each and every one of us. So what we are going to do, we are going to sing a song and then we are going to go out from there. Why don't you stand, grab the hand of the person next to you as we sing, and we're glad that we are a part of the family of God. Mm -hmm.